pretty good. <laughs> it's a mouthful. We need a better acronym, so maybe we can have a contest of whoever can come up with the best acronym. I mean, it's gotten even longer, actually, in the last in the last year because now that Cordex is kind of officially sponsored by WCRP, so now we have to, you know, now it's the WCRP Cordex flagship pilot study on convection. Um, I, I don't know that the longer name necessarily will translate to uh, improved, improved results. I don't think there's a correlation. Um, so basically, two years ago when I was here at the first, um, at the first meeting of the convection permitting modeling uh, uh, workshop. We hadn't even started yet. I mean, I don't think we had our kickoff in the fall of 2016. And basically what I presented was a skeleton, an idea that we, that we had for this. Um, we had submitted an application in the spring of 2016. Um, it had been approved. And then Erica Coppola and I were tasked with putting this, uh, putting this beast together. The, and so what I'll do. Um, Today is kind of give an update, um, show some results. So we already have a set of ensemble runs of some, uh, some test cases that we've done, running in uh, a weather-like mode, so very similar to like an NWP type experiment, and then also a climate mode where we initialize the models about a month before events to just gauge how the ensemble is performing um, at kind of a longer initialization um, uh, time scale. So we call that climate mode, although it's not really that far in it that far in advance. Um, so I'll go through some of these results. They'll be appearing in uh, Climate Dynamics uh, shortly. Um, we just got our last uh, re reviews. Um, they're minor, so they should be done within a week or two. Um, and then talk a little bit about the challenges that we face um, and, uh, yeah, and the, way, the way forward. So, um, so I'll go through this part pretty well. Let's see here. There we go. Um, so the outline is basically talk a little bit about FPS and where it fits within Cordex. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on that because I think you all have probably seen something to this effect if you've seen our presentations at EGU or AGU or at this uh, workshop last time. Um, and then also very quickly a timeline, how we got to where we are now. And then I'll spend most of my time talking about the, the test cases that are, that are appearing in this climate dynamics issue and how the model is performing and how these um, I've had some uh, su surprising, um, some surprises, some, some not, not so surprising results, um, and what that means for the community as a whole, um, and then our challenges and kind of our next steps. Um, and of course, we don't need to have so much motivation for why we might want to do this. I mean, we've seen lots of this already. Um, this is just from a month or so ago in, uh, in southern France, um, flooding down, uh, yeah, down near uh, Marseille and Montpellier. This was, and there. Come on. Okay, good. So, um, so very briefly, for those who don't know, I think most do. Cordex is this coordinated regional downscaling experiment. Um, the idea is to downscale our global climate models over basically all the land masses of the world. So, um, and lots of overlapping ma land masses in the world. Um, so we have Europe, which is the one that I'm most involved in. Um, this is also, a, and then the Mediterranean folks figure that the European domain wasn't going far enough south because um, we need more, uh, uh, we need more of, uh, you know, more of Africa in there. So they asked for a lot for their own domain to investigate kind of Mediterranean processes. And then there's here's a polar region here. All land masses, all the RCPs, most of the CMIP5 models that provided enough output to do this. Um, resolutions around uh, 12 to 50 kilometers. Um, the idea is to have multi-model ensembles to investigate climate impacts and um, aid the development of climate services and also, um, um, yeah, and, um, and then also uh, contribute to the next set of IPCC reports. Um, and then we're also coordinating with CMIP-6 through this new Cordex uh, MIP, which I guess isn't a real MIP, but it's a virtual MIP. I don't know what that means. Not quite sure. So the motivation for doing these flagship pilot studies, though, arose out of the fact that this Cordex activity is very much production-based, right? You've got big multi-model ensembles, 100-year-long transient simulations for all these RCP pathways. It's a huge amount of work. It's a huge amount of data. Lots of production effort going into it. Not a lot of time to actually do analysis on it. And, um, and so. Um, to start moving the science forward, the decision was made to have these splinter projects called flagship pilot studies. Um, and the idea to have 
uh, you know, more quantitative assessment of added value, better understanding of processes and phenomenon, um, and especially at convection permitting scales, so local scales, because even at 12 kilometers, we're not really resolving the extremes. Um, certainly not the most extremes, the most extreme extremes, I should say. Um, yeah, and then, of course, high resolution convection permitting modelings, and then integrating us a little bit better in other WCRP programs like GUEX. So um, trying to get our minds thinking a little bit about real world applications. So similar to what Peter was talking about that very first day. So what is this all for, right? What is, what are, what is our, you know, scientifically, we can come up with lots of really great reasons for why we want to do this. But there's also um, an interest beyond our own um, in what we're doing here. And I think that these kinds of ensembles can contribute to that. So for the um, convection project over Europe and uh, in the Mediterranean, here's our domain. It's our mandatory domain. It goes from 40 north to 15, uh, 40 to 50, from 0 to 17. It captures um, the entire alpine chain, uh, much of the um, lowlands to the, to the north and to the west. Um, also, it was important to get um, the Golfo Lyon and um, in the Adriatic here, so we can have uh, MCSs that are developing out over here and propagate onto the land and um, resolve those, um, and to have enough space for them to, to develop. This domain is nested within kind of the standard cortex domain. Um, so most of the groups are using a nest where they uh, nest within the standard cortex domain. There are some other groups that are using some different domains on the outer, um, on outside of this mandatory domain, like uh, the Met Office and um, ETH, I believe, are using a slightly different outer domain. The idea is to provide a collective multi-model ensemble assessment and intercomparison platform, um, and uh, ultimately to investigate future climate change and to assess consequences on convective phenomenon impacts at local to regional scales, not just extreme precipitation, um, but, also, um, but also related events, so flash floods, um, landslides, um, hydrological land surface uh, uh, impacts, for example. Um, and droughts, heat waves, et cetera. So not just for extreme precipitation, although that's, of course, what we're focusing on initially because it's what we know best. So we started in fall of 2016. Um, I'll go through this very quickly. If people are really interested in the timeline, the gory details, they'll be able to get this presentation later. Um, basically, we started out in November. We find some of our scientific aims, got a mandatory domain. Uh, experiment designs, we got a request then in the winter of 2017 for test cases from the Cordex SAT, and this was a request that was not to be denied. Um, so there was some grumbling about this, and <laughs> I'm not naming names. <clears throat> <But> <laughs> NWP community, of course, is saying, yeah, you know, we do test cases all the time, this has been done. But not really in this ensemble framework, and not all of the modeling groups have run their, run their models um, in kind of climate mode as well. And we wanted to have a testing platform, too, where other groups that are coming into the um, consortium can, can try out their configurations. And so we're going to keep this, what I'm presenting here, we're going to keep as kind of a test bed for additional groups who want to come in and be a part of the, um, be a part of the consortium. Um, so then we've been busy, busy at EGU, and then presenting some things at AGU as well, getting our variable list down. Um, I should mention that the entire group is about 30 teams. Um, and then the, what I'll be showing today is the outcomes uh, from about 22 member ensembles. Um, so it's a big group of people and a large number of teams that are doing this. And so on the one hand, we have to balance the desire to do coordinated experiments, right? So we have to try to constrain the experiment as much as we, as much as we can while letting the differences that we see arise from model internal variability and model choices for physics, for example. Um, balanced with the fact that most of these groups are performing this voluntarily. They're using internal funding, basic funding, um, sometimes a little bit of funding from EU projects, for example, but there's no like central funding plot pot that's contributing to um, support the develop, to support the, um, these experiments and these simulations. So, um, so there's quite some latitude for modeling teams to to make choices like, do they want to nudge or do they not want to nudge? Well, that may not just be because of scientific reasons that they want to do it, but also computational concerns, right? Because it's going to slow down the simulations. Um, so yes, last November, we finalized our timeline for 2018. So right now, the ERA interim evaluation runs are, are in progress. Um, 
And then we had yeah, a last splinter meeting at EGU where I gave a talk. And there's all kinds of bookkeeping stuff that we have to, uh, have to pay attention to. And also issues with the simulations. So there's some issues with snow in some of our simulations that we have to try to figure out. So we also worked on extending our scientific aims. And I mentioned this already previously, that it's not just extreme precipitation that we're interested in. We're also interested in the changes in the background state and the future climate. We're interested in what this means for the circulations at local to regional scales. Um, high altitude uh, impacts in, hydro in hydrology, for example, mesoscale processes, low level winds and conversions, or graphic phenomenon, the life cycles, um, and how those change in the context of a changing climate. And of course, we've seen a lot on this aspect, uh, land atmosphere interactions, subsurface, surface atmosphere, um, and, those, and the impacts that those can have. Um, also, <clears throat> and our, our science aim is to uh, expand on considering aggregate statistics and uh, use convective permitting models to develop uh, to help develop parameterizations at coarser scales. So this is an idea of uh, upscaled added value in contributing to global modeling as well at coarser resolution. So what can we learn about processes that can then be fed back up the model, uh, the model scale to coarser resolutions? And we've also has, have as a name um, working on hybrid dynamical statistical techniques um, as well. And this one is actually one of our challenges. I'll come back to it. And it's been lagging a little bit behind. The enthusiasm is there. But again, uh, the, the time to put in the effort is, uh, is at the moment uh, um, kind of playing second fiddle to the dynamical downscaling. But I think that this is going to be a, an interesting avenue to explore and see if we can develop convective emulators that can be used to um, to supplement and complement the work that we're doing with the dynamical ensemble. So now on to our, our test cases. So um, go right to this. So we have these three, three test cases, different times of the year, different locations, different types of events. And so this was the idea, is to choose some variety and some diversity of events, see how the systems perform with different initializations. Right? So this is called the weather-like, where there's the systems are initialized right before the events. And then there's a climate mode, where they're initialized a month previously. Um, I should mention that all the teams spun up their soil moisture and those sorts of things for years beforehand. Um, the first event is, was part of HIMEX. So this is a really nice, the collaboration with HIMEX has been um, really great. So this is an area where convection permitting modeling um, climate modelers have come together with the NWP community um, and are working collaboratively in a really, really nice way. So this was an event that had really, uh, was really well observed um, in uh, 2012. And so we decided that would be a really good one to analyze. Um, it's been published on. It's been kind of, it's been dissected to death. Um, so it's something that the community understands really well. The other event was an extreme precipitation event on the north side of the um, Austrian Alps um, in 2009. This was, an, this was a summertime event. This was June. Um, I should mention that the HIMEX event was October. Um, and then we had a FERN event in Switzerland um, that was in uh, November of 2014. So I'm going to go through the results from these and, and uh, yeah, talk a little bit more about the protocol first. So, um, right, so the purpose is right here, which I already mentioned. Um, the idea is so get an idea of our expectations from these kind of climate type simulations where we're increasing the internal variability by having a longer lead time and to see if there's any memory left in the system. Remember, the models have, uh, can, can develop their own internal variability within the intermediate domain, for sure. Um, and also setting up a testing platform. So woo, boy, that didn't turn out so great. So this is the uh, background state for the first event. So um, here is Spain. Italy, Greece, da, 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 da. So <laughs> you guys can understand. Get yourself situated. Here's the Mediterranean, OK? <laughs> um, so this was an event that was the evolution of a trough, fairly slow moving. Um, and you can see really strong background synoptic state. That's the important thing here is to and remember this. because um, and, and also go back to the, was Ruby's talk like the first talk? 
may have been like one of the first talks that we had. And uh, we recall her talk about the importance of the background synoptic state, because I'm going to come back to that. Um, so the evolution of a trough interacting with an upper level low um, produced slow propagating MCSs. Um, the largest impacts were along the French uh, coast and then also along um, the, the, Italian, the Italian coasts. And these resulted in large flood events and um, intense precipitation. So in France, 170 millimeters in 36 hours. Italy, locally, up to 245 in 24 hours. So this is how our ensemble performs in reproducing this event. On the, um, the, the pattern of the event, and the red numbers here are the spatial pattern correlation between the weather-like and the climate, uh, climate mode. Actually, you know what? I did this backwards. These should be swapped. The, um, oh no, that's right, sorry, never mind. Um, the weather like should be higher, so that's right. Um, basically what we did is computed the spatial correlation skill score for the total accumulated precipitation over these boxes where the largest imp impact was, was felt, and these are the averages from there. Um, in the bottom, this is for the weather like mode, this is the ensemble, the ensemble mean. Um, and this is for the uh, climate mode, so the, the one where the models have more freedom to develop inside. And so you can see that both of them reproduce the patterns reasonably well. Um, but I should mention that there's a lot of spread. And in the coming slides, I'm going to show you how much spread there is. So the ensemble mean, is, of course, for the spatial pattern correlation is better than um, any individual model run. Um, and uh, there's quite some spread for these events. And that comes mainly, we think, um, but this is being investigated in more detail, from the complexity of the interactions between the land and the ocean, and of course the interaction with topography, because there's lots and lots of topography that to interact with here. So um, in these, the little dots here are showing the observations, and these smoothed are areas in here, they just ran a, um, a simple interpolation scheme with the available observations to have a pattern to compare against. So again, left-hand side here is the weather-like, right-hand side is climate-like. And I'll be showing some more plots like these, so keep that in mind. So, but if we look at the ensemble itself, so the individual ensemble members, um, we see quite a bit more spread. Now, this is a pretty complex figure, so I'll spend some time on it. Um, I'll show these for the other cases as well. Um, and if it's you know, too, uh, too confusing to look at all kinds of squiggly lines and, and colored uh, dots and squares and triangles, the take-home messages are right here on the left-hand side. So the spatial pattern correlations um, are shown here evolving through the time period of the event. The solid line is the 12 hourly precipitation in those boxes that I showed in the previous slide. These guys, two, three. so there's three of them. And you can see that the spatial pattern correlation, and this is from almost, this is zero down here, 0.5 is marked, is marked here. Um, so that the spatial pattern correlation for this event uh, isn't really super well reproduced by, by the individual members. Um, as the event progresses, right? Um, it does a little bit better in, uh, in the different areas. But overall, there's a really large spread in the individual ensemble members. And there's no discernible pattern in that the, uh, that the, the event becomes more coherent in the simulations as it, as it progresses. And you can see that down on the bottom. So these are the accumulated precipitation amounts for both the weather-like and the climate-like um, modes for all the individual members. And you can see that mostly the observations are in, are in a solid black line. And you can see that most of the ensemble is, is initializing this event too late, and the magnitude is too weak. And that's true for all of the different impact areas that we chose for this event to analyze. There's a couple of members that are kind of way out on the, on the end there, but by and large, they're, they're too late, too weak. Okay. And then on the bottom is showing the ensemble mean. And the dark line is the observations. The blue line is the um, kind of NWP type simulations. And then beneath it is the um, it's dotted line is the ensemble mean for the climate mode. And so you can see you get a little bit closer with the um, weather-like initialization. But not always. So in this, in this box, it wasn't the case. Um, but then the same down here. 
Okay, so large spread, underestimation, timing is off. But in the ensemble mean and over the course of the entire event, it looks kind of reasonable. So it depends on what one is, one is looking at. This is our second event, which was over Austria. Background state. Notice that it's a much weaker um, and quiescent black background state compared to what I showed in the previous event. That's important. I'll come back to it. This was a really intense uh, precipitation event um, from a cutoff low, isolated over southern Europe. Um, really just unstable, moist air that was impinged against the Alps with um, embedded deep convection. So this is the kind of stuff that's going to be really interesting for us to investigate and really difficult, I think, um, to, to reproduce, at least in a coherent, uh, coherent way in an ensemble framework. Um, 354 millimeters of uh, precipitation and with a return period of, uh, so it's a 100 year, um, 100 year event, basically. 130 millimeters per 24 hours. So high impact though. So here's the ensemble performance over the entire event again. Um, again, the spatial pattern correlation is calculated for the central area here. This is where your maximum precip in the OBS was. Here's our ensemble mean, which captures the pattern quite nicely in the weather-like mode, and even captures the pattern reasonably well in the um, climate mode, but uh, with much, much reduced magnitude. And, and the reason for that, I'll show, is when we start looking into the actual ensemble members themselves in the next slide. Basically, you have a really huge spread in this case. Um, so the spatial pattern correlations, as I said before, are quite good. But remember, spatial pattern correlation doesn't tell you anything about magnitudes. It just kind of gives you an idea that the, that the pattern is correct, right? And, um, and it evolves quite nicely along with the event. So you have increases in the spatial pattern correlation as the event peaks. And then, of course, it goes down as it dissipates. Um, so that's quite encouraging. But then when you look at the accumulated precipitation, you can see the OBS here. And you can see that some of the model systems completely miss the event. And you can see that in the spatial plots as well. I mean, and by miss the event, I mean completely miss the event. There's nothing, there's nothing in there. Um, and, um, and then you see that, that result, especially in the climate mode, which is way down, way down here when you look at the multi-model ensemble mean. This is the weather-like event. And there have been some, um, so this has spurred some side investigations by the, by the team to say, why is it, oh, wow, good. Why is this happening? Um, and really internal variability, the take home message in internal variability plays a really large role because it's a weekly, and, and it's a weekly forced synoptic state. So the last event, the Fern event, where we did best, again, super strong background state. Um, big Fern event, southerly, um, so persistent southerly flow over the Alps. Um, and basically, yeah, we had a huge event, a total of 500 millimeters of rain. So this one's easy. Um, almost every model got it. Um, spatial pattern correlations of 0.91 for both weather-like and climate-like, which is really interesting. So initialized a whole month beforehand, and almost every model nailed it. Um, these are the pattern. These are the ensemble means. And then when we look at the ensemble spread, you see spatial pattern correlations through the evolution of the event that are really high, almost every really tight spread, almost every model over 0.5. Um, really good initial is at the uh, time of uh, uh, the, the timing of the event is really good. The ma and the magnitude is actually pretty, pretty good as well. And you can see here in the ensemble mean that they're really quite close to each other and quite close to the observations, um, slightly missing the maximum and the magnitude. So this was a really, uh, really promising one. So to summarize this one, um, so it was an illustrative of both the promise and the challenges, right? So events driven by large scale condition, uh, the closer the agreement between the ensemble members. This was clear. Complex local scale interactions, such as the Mediterranean case, are really apparent. That contributes to some of the uncertainty in the spread. Um, and then a weakly forced synoptic event like over Austria is not well reproduced at all. And this all has implications for future climate change if we think about it. Because if the background state changes, that's going to have an effect on the confidence and our ability to reproduce um, the, the changes in the future as well. Um, challenges. Yeah, so here's a, a smattering <laughs> of the challenges that we face. Um, observations we've talked about. Storage is huge. 300 terabytes we're looking at just for our evaluation runs. Um, yeah, issues related to internal variability and physics parameterizations. So one of the side uh, offshoot uh, investigations 
by the Santander group looked at the, some of the simulations that missed this Austria event um, and determined that uh, and they were WARF models. It happened to be that the best performing model in that event also was a WARF simulation from, from our group. And so we had this nice multi-physics uh, ensemble of Worf with the WARF model. And they also then ran a bunch of uh, jittered initial condition simulations with the WARF model, but with, a, with the same configuration. No difference. So the initial condition spread was the same as the spread that you get from the multi-physics. So a word of caution that it's difficult to attribute differences to just a choice of physics. We also have to consider the contribution from internal variability. Um, and currently, as I said before, our hybrid dynamical statistical efforts are lagging behind, and that's, that needs to be addressed as well, because I think that we can do a lot with that. Um, yep, the way forward, um, yeah, solve all our challenges, save the world, or just wait until the, our interim simulations are done, and in a storage facility near you, well, not near you, in Ulich, which is near some of us. Um, but really, most importantly is that this is a community effort and we want this to be not just a community effort for modeling teams and modeling groups in Europe, but for all of us. Um, and so we welcome, we welcome everybody, basically. So it's an invitation as well. So thank you very much. Contact me, contact Erica. And um, yeah, we'll start making use of that RAL CPM email list as well. Thanks.